Thank you, Jane, for providing me with this opportunity. And um, I'm sharing my screen. And let, let me know when you can see my screen. Uh, am I equipping myself? Yes, I can see you. OK, perfect. Um, so guys, uh, today's topic is on the database offerings that are in Azure. And uh, there are a number of uh, database offerings in Azure. And in this uh, approximately one hour or one hour, 15 minutes, I will try to cover them uh, as much as possible. So guys, the agenda would be that um, uh, if you have uh, any questions, kindly type them in the chat window and I will try my level best to answer them in the end. I would like to continue with my presentation so that I could uh, uh, wrap the things up uh, in in this uh, uh, available time. So this is a little bit about myself. Who am I? Uh, my name is Uzair Akbar Raja, and uh, originally I am from uh, Rawalpindi, Pakistan, and I am based in Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, I have done masters in software engineering from uh, Likenge Institute of Technology, that is located in Karlskrona, Sweden. And I am working as a data warehouse specialist in uh, Exilia Pharmaceuticals. This is a pharmaceutical company located in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I have around 14 years of experience from uh, Danish pharmaceutical industry, where primarily I have worked with uh, databases, data warehouses, business intelligence, and cl cloud computing. Then uh, this is the link to my LinkedIn profile if you would like to get connected with me. And then there are some of the certifications that I have done, and then there are some more certifications on the way hopefully this year. So the agenda for uh, uh, today's presentation. Uh, we'll be discussing about, uh, about the cloud models because it is very important to understand the cloud models before we can uh, proceed with discussing the database offerings. Uh, then I'll be telling you about uh, uh, platform as service database offerings in Azure. I'll be covering infrastructure as service database offerings in Azure. And uh, then we will also touch base on uh, open source database offerings in Azure. Then we will also talk about uh, NoSQL databases because these are getting very popular in nowadays. Uh, I will also talk about Azure Cache for Redis. Many people don't consider Azure Cache for Redis as a database solution, but it is a kind of caching solution that can complement your Azure databases, and we will discuss about it. And then the most interesting thing I will also cover about uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and Oracle Azure Interconnect. So it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of multi-cloud architecture. And then I will also discuss about Oracle databases and how you can uh, uh, move Oracle databases onto an Azure Virtual Machine. And then in the end, I will wrap up the things. And then in the end, I also have some useful links that I would share with you so that you can go to those links and further learn uh, about those technologies. So in this uh, 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 in this uh, slide, you can see that uh, this is from uh, uh, Gartner's Magic Quadrant, and it is from December last year. And you can clearly see that uh, uh, Microsoft is the leader in uh, cloud DBMS platforms. So this is just to set the scene of what we are discussing today. Um, it is closely followed by uh, Amazon Web Services, but still Microsoft is the leader in this uh, uh, in this space. Um, when we are talking about cloud models, and especially when we are talking about uh, uh, about your data centers that are on premise, in on premise data centers. Uh, we are responsible for everything, starting from uh, networking, storage, maintaining servers, doing virtualization, uh, op uh, patching up your operating system, installing middleware, runtime, and then application and the data. And uh, it can be it can be a little bit uh, uh, costly to run a data center uh, on premise. Therefore, companies are leveraging and shifting their uh, workloads to the cloud and in the cloud you normally have three types of models that are available you have uh, IaaS for infrastructure as service you have uh, PaaS or platform as a service and then you have SaaS or software as a service 
And in IAS model, uh, what happens is that you offload your networking, storage and server and virtualization workloads to the vendor. And in this case to Microsoft Azure, and you are only responsible for the applications and the virtual machines. Um, in the case of platform as a service, what happens is that you also offload more um, responsibilities to the cloud, to your cloud vendor, including the runtime, middleware, and the virtualization platform together with operating system. So you are only responsible for the application and the data in the case of platform as a service. While in, sof in uh, software as a service, you are actually leveraging also the application uh, uh, to the to the vendor, and here you actually work with uh, uh, with subscriptions. For example, uh, Microsoft 365 is a classic example of uh, uh, software as a service. Um, so these uh, uh, three parameters are very important to uh, know before we proceed with the uh, uh, database offerings in Azure. And if we start with uh, uh, platform as service offerings in Azure, so in Azure, there are two types of uh, platform as uh, service databases. You have Azure SQL database, and then you have SQL, Azure SQL managed instance. So these are the two databases, primary, primary databases that are available in Azure for platform as a service. And within Azure SQL database, it can further be divided into two types of databases, which is a single instance database or a single database. And then you also have a elastic pool. And I will come back to it. What is a single database and what is an elastic pool? And within the single database, it can further be divided into a single database that is provisioned with a compute tier and single database that is provisioned with a serverless compute tier. And I will come back to it, uh, uh, what it is. Then uh, among the Azure managed instance, you have uh, uh, two types of uh, uh, offerings in Azure. One is the single instance um, a database, and then you also have an instance pool. And uh, currently the instance pool is in a public preview, and this is something that uh, many people are waiting for, because uh, what happens in, in a single instance database is that uh, if you have a smaller workloads, then in order to move the smaller workloads, you really have to do a lot of uh, uh, careful capacity planning and resource governance. In addition, you also need to do some security considerations and some extra data consolidations at the instance level. And uh, with the help of instance pools, you will be able to offload, you will, you will be able to move your smaller uh, databases easily to the, uh, to the cloud. And the instance pool also provides you support for native VNet integrations, so you can actually deploy your uh, uh, databases into the into the cloud. Uh, before moving to the uh, nature of the Azure SQL databases, it is also important to discuss the cloud models, the purchasing models in cloud. For Azure SQL databases, there are two types of uh, purchasing models that are available. We have a DTU model or database transaction unit model, and we also have a V core model. And um, then uh, if we look into the DTU model, DTU is actually, it is a major, or you can say that it is a blend of CPU, memory, and IO. And IO includes both uh, the data IO and the transactional IO. Uh, so this means that the higher the number of DTU, the more powerful database we have. And uh, DTU was first introduced with Azure SQL database. And with DTU model, you pay a fixed price for your compute or IO or memory, as well as your storage and backup retention. And in vCore model, you have a separate charges for your compute and storage. So in a vCore model, your compute and storage are isolated from each other. And um, you can also specify the number of V cores that you would like to purchase based on your uh, on, uh, based on your workload. Uh, if we look into the further uh, classification within the DTU, we have three types of classification within the DTU. You you have a basic tier, standard tier, and premium tier that is available in a in a DTU. 
and in week or you have three tiers available journal purpose which is uh, for uh, for general purpose workloads and it is backed by the azure premium storage and it has higher latency than the than the business critical then you have a business critical which is for high performance workloads offering the lowest latency and uh, this tier is backed by the local ssd instead of azure blob storage so since you are using a uh, ssd drive, uh, drive so you have uh, you have a low latency in this case and then you all have a hyperscale uh, tier that is available and in hyperscale tier uh, normally in azure sql database you cannot go beyond 4 terabytes of uh, storage space but if you'd like to go beyond 4 terabytes of storage space then you will switch to hyper tier in which you have a, a capacity of around 100 terabytes and guys if you are using um, Azure SQL database and you choose the DTU model, later on you can switch to the vCore model. Or if you have started with a vCore model, you can switch to the back to the DTU model. But if you choose a vCore model and you choose hyperscale in it, then you cannot switch to the DTU model because hyperscale is a it's it's a different technology. So this is very important thing to uh, keep in mind. Uh, if we look into the purchasing models, you can see that uh, in a DTU model, your compute and storage are interconnected, which means that if you increase your compute, your storage also increases. And um, there could be situations where you are increasing your co compute and your storage is also increasing, but on the other hand, you are not using that storage. So this means that most of your storage would be underutilized. So if you have a situation like this where uh, you want to have a separate, which you, where you want to have a independence between the compute and the storage, then you should go for the vCore model, where you can increase your compute irrespective of the storage, and you can increase your storage irrespective of the compute. So DTU model and vCore models are very important to consider when you are thinking about moving your database workloads to the cloud because uh, uh, you have to control the price and you have to best decide which model, which pricing model suits you. Now, if we do a kind of comparison between the DTU and vCore models, I think the most important thing is that, uh, um, that the maximum compute capacity with DTU is around 4,000 DTUs and in vCore it is around 80 vCores. And the maximum storage, as I've told you, both with DTU and vCore is four terabytes. But if you want to go beyond four terabytes, then the option would be to go for the to go for the hyperscale um, tier. And in hyperscale tier, you can actually scale up to 100 terabytes, which is which is a, a huge amount of uh, uh, storage. And as far as the pricing is concerned, guys, pricing is very important. And it is also one of the factors that would decide, that would be very critical in deciding which architect, which database offering to use when you are migrating from your own premise to the to the cloud. That in case of DTU, the price is at the DTU level, which means that it is a fixed price for both storage and compute. But in the case of vCore, you pay a separate price for your compute and storage. So it in case if you have a if you are looking for a workload in which you can, you do not have that much uh, storage requirements, but you do want to have a higher compute, then it would be good to go for a vCore pricing model in that case. Um, as far as Azure SQL database is concerned, as I have told you that it is of uh, two types, single SQL database, it can be with a, a prevision compute and it can be a, with a serverless compute. So as far as uh, a single database with prevision compute is that uh, um, this option enables you to quickly set up an SQL database and um, uh, Microsoft manages the server that you create as a part of SQL database creation. So you just have to focus on conf configuring the database, creating the database objects and populating it with the data. And uh, you can also scale the database if you need additional storage space, memory, and processing power. And uh, the resources that are allocated to the single instance database, uh, you are charged per hour for utilizing these resources. 
guys remember uh, if you are using provision compute for a single database and you want to scale you cannot scale automatically so you have to uh, pause stop your database and then you have to scale your um, database and then you have to re uh, restart uh, start your database again so there is a there is a little bit delay that is involved in it because provisioned compute for single uh, database will not provide you automatic scaling it will provide you scaling but that would be a manual scaling and the other thing that you can that you should note is that uh, you cannot stop or pause an sql database in the provision tier um, which means that uh, if you are not using your database you cannot stop your database or you cannot pause your database you have to either delete your database if you are not using it in the provision tier uh, when we go for the uh, serverless compute in the single uh, instance database uh, it uses the general purpose service tier with gen 5 hardware for based on vcore purchasing model and uh, Microsoft creates its own server, which is actually shared with the number of other uh, Azure subscribers. But Microsoft will ensure the privacy of your database. And uh, in the serverless compute, the database will automatically scale and it will automatically allocate and deallocate resources. Um, there is one thing that you need to note that a single database, whether it is a serverless compute or a provision compute, it does not support linked servers. So if you are migrating any workload from your own from my servers to the Azure cloud and you are selecting, a, you are choosing a single database, but if there is some kind of linked servers associated in it, then they will not work on the on the single database because it's, it's, a, it's a single database. And um, uh, there is also another very important feature in single database that uh, uh, with serverless compute that it will automatically do a pause. So if there is an inactivity for some specified period of time, then the database will automatically pause. And during the pause state, Azure will not charge you for vCores. However, you will only pay for the for the storage cost. Um, there are some uh, limitations with the uh, uh, single SQL database for a uh, uh, single Azure database for serverless compute. And you have to consider this if you are looking for the serverless compute option. And those limitations are that uh, the serverless compute does not support geo replication. So geo replication in Azure database is a feature that allows you to create a, a readable scannery database in the same region or in the another region. And you can always fail over to the secondary database in case of outage for a long time on the primary database server. And this feature is not supported in, um, in a single uh, database with serverless compute. And uh, this also does not support the long-term backup retention policy, LTR, in which you can actually store your backup for a period of 10 years. And um, uh, this uh, serverless compute also does not support the elastic jobs and it also does not support the feature of SQL database sync. So it, SQL database sync is a feature that lets you synchronize the data in a bi-directional, uh, by providing bi-directional communication between multiple databases that can both be uh, in the cloud and also on-premise. And this feature is not available in a, in a single instance database. So if we do a comparison between uh, uh, serverless compute and provision compute, uh, serverless compute is normally useful where you have unpredictable usage with uh, lower average compute utilization over time. On the other hand, uh, provision compute is for more regular usage pattern with higher average consumption utilization over time, or you have uh, using or you're using multiple databases in an elastic pool. Uh, the management effort, the performance management effort is lower in uh, serverless compute while there is some kind, some level of effort in the in the provision compute. And I, as I have told you that uh, the compute scaling is automatic in serverless compute while it is manual in uh, provision compute. And um, billing granularity is also very important. With serverless compute, you are paying your bill per second. While with, uh, with the provision compute, you will be billed per hour. So that was about uh, the Azure SQL database. 
uh, in uh, in the uh, pass offering the next type of uh, offering that we have under the umbrella of pass offering is in a, is an elastic pool so what actually is an elastic pool elastic pool you can say that uh, it is a pool of resources and by resources it means storage memory and processing power so you have a pool of resources and then you have a, a number of your uh, azure sql databases and when there is a need for uh, more power storage or more memory to a certain database, you will move that database to the pool. It will get all the necessary storage memory and processing power. And when that database doesn't need it, it will be moved back out of the pool. So this could be used in an environment where you have uh, unpredictable workloads. For example, uh, if you have a uh, if you have an Azure, if you have a database that is running in the production environment where there is a lot of activity going up during the night time, but during the daytime there is not that much activity going on, then you can use uh, Elastic Pool for this where during the night time more uh, resources would be allocated to your databases because they need more uh, processing power, memory, and storage at that time. And during the daytime when those databases are mostly idle, they would be those resources would be deallocated and then they can be moved allocated to some other database or for example you are using some uh, you are running some finance database where a lot of activity is going on at the end of the month whereas during the beginning of the month and in the middle of the month there is not that much activity going on in the database so in these kind of scenarios where you are where you have unpredictable spikes in the in the database workloads it would be uh, really good to go with the uh, uh, with the elastic pools. Uh, but uh, there's also one thing that you need to consider that uh, there are also some limitations with elastic pools. And uh, one of the limitations is that uh, uh, elastic pool does not support linked servers like Azure SQL database. So if you have some kind of workload that is based on an uh, on a linked server, then elastic pool will not be a uh, uh, candidate for that. Now, if we talk about the backups in uh, in the Azure SQL databases, uh, the automatic backups is the most prominent feature of a PaaS offering because you have offloaded your uh, 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 lot of responsibilities to your uh, cloud vendor, which is Azure in this case, Microsoft in this case. So Microsoft will take care of the backups of your databases, and those backups are automated backup. And uh, the backups for Azure SQL, whether it is single instance or elastic pool, are stored in uh, Azure Blob Geo Redundant Storage. And backups are retained for seven to 35 day days based on the service tier that you are choosing. And the schedule of the backups is that uh, your full backups are kept for a one week. Your differential backups are taken every 12 hours and your log backups are taken after every five minutes to 10 minutes, depending upon your uh, uh, transactional log activity. Um, and then there are two other important things that uh, you cannot restore uh, the backup phone on an existing database in, uh, in this. You have to either rename that database and then restore that backup, or you have to remove the previous database and then restore the uh, backup on the existing uh, in the existing uh, environment and it is also not possible to restore a database using tsql commands like restore database due to the nature of the uh, platform as a service platform so these are some of the uh, uh, restrictions that are uh, with the backups related to azure sql databases and as far as the benefits are concerned the most important benefit is that you get automatic updates and patches for the SQL servers, which means that every time Microsoft launches a new version of uh, uh, of uh, SQL server, you will always get the newest version of, uh, of the SQL server. And uh, it gives you a 99.99% SLA, and which is one of the highest SLAs in the in the in the cloud industry. And you can always do a point in time restore for your databases. It supports uh, active geo replication. And then uh, it also supports uh, threat protection and database auditing. And then encryption is something that is very important with, uh, uh, with Azure uh, platform. 
that your data in motion is always encrypted using trans transport layer security. Your data at rest is encrypted using transparent data encryption and the data that is in use that is always uh, encrypted. Now we move to another uh, offering which is uh, Azure SQL Managed Database. And uh, Azure SQL Managed Database is, uh, is a kind of database that provides you some more uh, benefits as compared to the Azure SQL databases. Like for example, um, in an Azure SQL database, you can actually do a lift and shift of your cloud databases to the uh, Azure SQL databases. And it also provides you features with uh, like, for example, automatic backups, patching the database, and it also provides you complete control and over security and resource allocation for your SQL database. Um, guys, if you are using uh, SQL features like uh, linked servers, service broker, or database mail, then you should go for the managed instance uh, database. Um, it also reduces the overhead of running the SQL server on a, on, a, on a virtual machine because you are only responsible for managing your database where there are a lot of features that you are get that you are getting like automatic backups and patching. Then uh, um, with the Azure SQL managed instance, your system admin, the time of your system administrators would be freed up because they would spend less time on doing administrative tasks. And uh, uh, it also provides you 100 compatibility with your SQL Enterprise Edition that is running on premise, which means that you can easily lift and shift your on premise SQL workloads to Azure SQL Managed Instance. And um, then you get, uh, um, then you also get. Uh, other features with it. One thing very important with the Azure SQL Managed Instance is that uh, um, Azure SQL Managed Instance, it does not support your application. So um, for, for your application of instances in Azure SQL Managed Instance, you should actually use automatic failover groups. Um, then uh, with, with the reference to Azure SQL Managed Instance, you get uh, uh, backup with the Azure storage. You get telemetry data with the help of Azure Event Sub. It has an integration with Azure Active Directory for authentication, and uh, it supports both uh, the uh, traditional SQL Server database engine logins, and also you can also integrate it with your Azure Active Directory. And uh, it also provides you VNet uh, integration for uh, uh, for connectivity. Um, now. With Azure SQL database, Azure SQL Managed Instance database, um, you will get uh, Azure Data Factory for doing uh, SSIS related integrations. And you will also get uh, Azure Analysis Services for, uh, uh, for doing your tabulation models using uh, uh, SSAS. And um, instead of using SSRS, it will provide you with the Power BI, so you can actually use paginated reports in Power BI um, to for SSRS. But if you really would like to mo use move your SSRS workload from on-premise into uh, Azure, and you want to use them with Azure SQL Managed Instance, uh, then the option would be that you should have a SQL Managed Instance uh, running catalog databases, and then you have installed, you know, you should install reporting services on an Azure SQL machine, and then you should do it, uh, authenticate it using SQL, Azure SQL uh, authentication. And this is in the case if you have some SSRS workloads and you cannot, and you have to, you want to use those SQL SSRS workloads in the Azure environment. Now guys, there could be situations where uh, you are running on a specific version of SQL database. For example, you are running on SQL Server 2014. You are running on SQL Server 2010-12, and you want to move your those workloads to the cloud because you are running some validated application that cannot run on the newest version of SQL Server, or you are running some kind of uh, database application that has a dependency with the operating system. So in that case, you cannot use uh, Azure SQL database or you cannot use Azure SQL Managed Instance 
then the option would be you can use SQL Server on a Azure Virtual Machine. So since you are running it on an Azure Virtual Machine, it will provide you with this kind of uh, operating system uh, dependence. And um, uh, with, the v with the Virtual Machine, you will have full administrative rights over your database management system and also the operating system. And Azure will maintain the Virtual Machine images and it manages virtual machine images for all major releases of SQL Server, and those Azure SQL virtual images are on Windows and SQL Server. And it also has a support for older version of SQL Servers, which means that, for example, if you're running old version of SQL Server 2012 and you want to move it to the cloud, then the option would be to uh, use as a, uh, to use SQL Server on a on a virtual machine. The guys, the important thing that you have to note here is that uh, in the case of uh, SQL Server on a virtual machine, you are responsible for operating system patching as well as optimal configuration of your network and storage options. And you are also responsible for the configuration of your SQL Server instance that is running in the uh, in the operating system. And um, with Azure SQL Server on a virtual machine, you have a support for older version of SQL servers, and you can also use uh, SSRS, SSAS, and SSIS in the same way uh, you were using it on the on-premise systems. Um, however, there are some, uh, some syntax differences in the TSQL commands that are used on the on-premise SQL server and Azure SQL server that is running on the virtual machine. And actually, you can. Um, I will paste this link in the in the chat where you can go in and see what sort of differences are there, and you can actually read this. There are some SQL commands that doesn't work on the Azure SQL running on a on a virtual machine. So this is also something that uh, you have to consider. One of the benefits of using Azure SQL on a virtual machine is that you can actually bring your uh, licenses onto the onto the cloud environment and there are uh, there are two ways of doing it one of them is called byol or bring your own license and the second one is pay as you go in uh, bring your own license uh, that is only available if your organization is participating in a microsoft assurance program and uh, that can provide pre purchase sql server licenses or you can transfer your on premise existing licenses into the virtual machine and you should do it when you have moved all your SQL servers to the cloud uh, because uh, it is not intended to use on premise. Uh, when, you have, when you have moved your licenses to the cloud, then you should not use uh, the on premise databases for which the licenses have been moved to the cloud. And this option also allows you to use your own images uh, to create the Azure virtual machines. And with pay as you go licensing, the cost is built in into the Five minutes charge for the virtual machine, and if you commit, if you commit to a virtual machine for a longer period of time, for example, two years, three years, or five years, then Microsoft will provide you more discount in pay as you go model, and um, you can also do, uh, you can also reserve your workloads in this case. Um, there is also something which is called Azure Hybrid Benefit. It is a kind of flexible offering in which you can move your Windows Server licenses, on-premise Windows Server licenses and on-premise SQL licenses, both of them at the same time into the, into the cloud. So Azure hybrid benefit is something different from bring your own license because in bring your own license model, you are only moving your SQL Server license, while with Azure hybrid benefit, you will be moving your SQL Server license and the uh, operating system license into the into the cloud. And then uh, with Azure SQL uh, on an Azure virtual machine, when you are creating a virtual, virtual machine, then you have different types of virtual machine sizing options that are available. And those are uh, divided into compute tier or memory optimized tier. And then there are a number of series in it. Like in compute tier, you have A series, B series and so on while in the memory optimized you have uh, e-series and uh, in this link you can actually uh, get more information about the uh, virtual machine sizes and which virtual machine size you should use for your uh, for your workload 
i will keep i will also post this uh, uh, url in the in the chat conversation um then what are the benefits of using uh, of using a sql server on azure virtual machine the first benefit is that uh, you can do a lift and shift kind of uh, migration where you can move your cloud workloads uh, uh, on premise workloads easily to the cloud so you can actually lift and shift them then you also get automated updates you also get automated backups and uh, as your virtual machine you get a downtime which is less than 8.77 hours per year which is really great and then you also get this option for always availability always on availability groups with uh, with azure virtual machine so these are the these are the benefits that are available as a part of uh, both platform as a service offering in which we covered azure sql database we covered azure sql managed instance and then uh, elastic pool and also with the infrastructure as an uh, as a service where we are discussing sql server on a azure virtual machine um it also provides you with an option of azure sql backup servers which you can actually use for disaster recovery and uh, with this service you can actually offload all the backup responsibilities to azure so your dbas will be more relieved because they would be they would be pushing all the backup responsibilities to the azure and it requires a backup agent to be installed on the virtual machine so that it could uh, take the automatic backups and this service provides comprehensive enterprise grade uh, backup solution so you can actually take backup of all the uh, databases of your uh, uh, of your co uh, uh, corporate organization and uh, it also provides you a single interface console so that you can monitor all these uh, activities then this is a kind of overview of what we have discussed so far regarding azure sql databases Azure SQL Managed Instance in Azure SQL on Virtual Machine. Uh, the important thing with Azure SQL Database is that it supports both uh, DTU and vCore. On the other hand, Azure SQL only Managed Instance only supports uh, vCore model, but it also supports other things like uh, linked server, closer compatibility with SQL Server, cross database queries, SQL auditing, SQL data sync, and DB mail. And there is also a native virtual network support in the Azure SQL Managed Instance. And in Azure SQL Managed Instance, you can have up to 100 databases. So this number is quite a lot. And then if you go for Azure SQL on a virtual machine, then you can have a, you can actually install a expensive version of SQL and OS versions because you have a choice. You would like to go with SQL Server 2012 or SQL Server 2014. You can also install it on Windows, Linux, or if you are using containers, then you can also install it on containers. And if you are using some backup, old backup mechanisms like file stream, which is really old, and if you have some back, uh, some Azure SQL databases that have a recovery model, which is set to simple, and you have to retain it, then the option would be to use Azure SQL on a, on a, on a virtual machine. So now we move to the open source offerings in Azure. And the open source offerings in Azure, you have uh, Azure SQL for Azure database for MySQL. You have Azure database for MariaDB and you have Azure SQL for Postgres SQL. So these are the three open source uh, databases that are supported on Azure, which means that if you have some on premise MySQL database, then you can move it to Azure SQL, Azure database for MySQL. If you are using some on-premise PostSQL, Postgres SQL database, then you can move it to Azure database for Postgres SQL. But guys, there are some limitations that we need to consider, and I will discuss it uh, further. With open source offerings, you also get the benefit of high availability, elasticity, uh, data encryption, both REST and motion. You also get automatic automatic backups, and you also get the option of uh, enterprise level security and compliance with the with the leg legislations. As far as the Azure database for MySQL is concerned, in it is available in two tiers in Azure. You have a single server tier and you have a flexible server tier. In the single server tier, 
it only supports MySQL version 5.6, 5.7, and 8.0 community edition. So this is very important to understand that in Azure uh, uh, Open System Database Platform, you only have a support for community edition, and for MySQL, you have a support for 5.6, 5.7, and version 8.0 under single server. And under the flexible server, it only supports MySQL version 5.7. And flexible server is something that was launched recently. And the reason, the benefit in, uh, uh, in a flexible server is that you can actually manage your window for the patching. Uh, when Microsoft will do a patching of the single server, it will do the patching. But in the flexible server, you can actually define your schedule where you want your uh, MySQL database to be, uh, to be patched. So, and then again, um, the MySQL flexible server database is available with the single availability zone, and it is also available with the uh, multiple availability zone. And then uh, the other difference between the single tier and the flexible tier in MySQL is that uh, in the single tier, you have uh, three type of configurations, basic, general purpose, and memory optimized. While in the flexible tier, you have uh, uh, configuration of uh, flexible uh, of uh, brustable architecture, general purpose, and memory optimized. Uh, so what happens with uh, with brustable is that uh, it depends upon it will not use your workload with full CPU capacity. Instead, whenever there is a need for CPU within brustable, it will assign CPU to it. So you can actually reduce your uh, uh, savings, um, re reduce your costs. So Whenever you are moving your MySQL workloads to the cloud, you should carefully think about which version you are using. You will be getting the community edition, and should you go for a single server or you would like to go for a flexible server. Then uh, as far as the MariaDB is concerned, there are two options for MariaDB. As either you can get a Azure database for MariaDB, which is a pass offering, or you can get a MariaDB on Azure Virtual Machine. Now the guys, the difference between the two is that, uh, for example, if you are using Azure database for MariaDB, then you have or you have an option to only get MariaDB Community Edition version 10.2 and 10.3. But if you are using some kind of uh, workloads on on-premise with the uh, uh, with the Enterprise Edition or Standard Edition of MariaDB, that is other than version 10.2 or 10.3 of the Community Edition then you have an option of uh, installing, creating a virtual machine with uh, MariaDB installed in it. Uh, guys, the biggest drawback with the MariaDB on a virtual machine is that uh, uh, you, are, you are controlling everything other than the virtual machine itself. And you have a significant amount of configuration and maintenance tasks that your database administrators have to do in case of a virtual machine you, on uh, MariaDB on a virtual machine. Then, uh, as far as uh, Postgres DB is concerned, um, Azure provides you with a service called Azure Database for Postgres DB. Uh, there are several. There are some kind. There are a lot of. Uh, there are some. Um, there are some features of Postgres SQL that are not available in uh, in Azure Database for Postgres SQL, and those services are related to the uh, interaction with the operating system. And um, in addition, you are also not able to do some uh, uh, server focus functionality, which is related to uh, server, which is related to Postgres SQL backup and restore using PG admin tool. That is also not supported. So this is also something that you need to consider. As far as uh, Azure Database for Postgres SQL is concerned, it is available with uh, um, uh, three tiers in Azure. You have a single server. You have a flexible server, and then you have a hyperscale option. Um, so within a single server, the thing is that uh, uh, it only supports Postgres SQL community version 9.5, 9.6, 10, and 11. And if you are going for a higher version than this, like uh, Postgres SQL community version 12 and 13, then you should go for a flexible server. As far as hyperscale is concerned, 
Hyperscale in Postgres SQL is a very, very special kind of deployment. Um, Hyperscale or CTES is a kind of extension that is available in Postgres. There are a number of extensions available in Postgres SQL. For example, you have uh, AppOS, you have uh, HypoPG, you have OpenFTS, you have PostGIS, you have Timescale DB that is used for uh, time series, and you also have a CTES, which actually transforms your uh, uh, Postgres SQL into a kind of a distributed database that enables the use of Postgres in a scale out or a cluster mode. So this option is also available in hyperscale with the option of hyperscale in Postgres SQL. So guys, if you are using any Postgres SQL database on premise and you would like to move it to the cloud, you should carefully consider these three options and how you can move your, um, your Postgres SQL to Azure SQL for Postgres SQL in the cloud. So this is a kind of summary of what sort of open source offerings are available in Azure. You can see that uh, we have a Azure SQL database for my Azure database for MySQL, Azure database for MariaDB, with an option of MariaDB on a virtual machine, and then you have Azure Postgres SQL, uh, Azure database for Postgres SQL, which is available in single server, flexible server, and with hyperscale. Uh, there is also another uh, service available in. Uh, in Azure that is called uh, database migration service. And this database migration service will actually help you to migrate your uh, existing on-premise MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres SQL uh, to the cloud. And you can also configure replication from your on-premise databases so that you, so that the changes that are made to the on-premise databases at the time when you were migrating the database are, are minimum. Then uh, as far as the known relational database or no SQL databases are concerned, they normally fall in four categories. You have uh, key value stores, you have document databases, you have column family databases, and then you have a graph databases. Under key value stores, the, the most popular databases are Amazon DynamoDB, Redis, and Aerospike. Among Cosmos database, you have, uh, among document database, you have Cosmos DB, you have MongoDB. Along, among column family databases, Apache Cassandra is the most popular uh, database in column family databases. And in graph databases, you have normally Neo4j and OrientDB that are the popular graph databases. Now, Microsoft provides a, a database called uh, Cosmos DB, and that Cosmos DB has number of APIs in it. With those APIs, you can actually interact with the key value store. You can also use the APIs in Cosmos DB to connect with a document database. You can also interface with the column family database and a graph database. And I will come to the Cosmos database. Cosmos database is a, is a database that is available under the product of NoSQL databases. And uh, this was a database that was back in the time it was called document DB by, by Microsoft. And it is a database as a service. It has a serverless architecture. It can also be configured with the non-serverless architecture. And uh, this is the database that has the highest SLA, 99.999%, so five nines. And it has a latency of less than 10 minutes per second for both read and write operations. And um, it is scalable. It is multimodal and also sports multi-language, uh, multi-language uh, sport. And then uh, Cosmos DB provides you with a lot of APIs. These are uh, these are the popular APIs that you can actually use. And that was uh, that is what I was saying that if you have to interact with the key value store, then you will use the table API within Cosmos DB. If you have to interact with the document database, it will use the SQL API, which is the native API of Cosmos DB. And if you're interacting with a column family database, then you will use Cassandra API. And if you are interacting with the graph database in Cosmos DB, then you will use the Gremlin API. Now, Microsoft also provides you an option. This is also uh, what sort of APIs are available and how uh, they can be interacted with, uh, uh, within, the, within the area of Cosmos DB. And you can see that Cosmos DB is, has a global distribution. 
It also supports horizontal partitioning. It also supports automatic index indexing, and you also get a provision throughput throughput with uh, uh, with Cosmos DB. Uh, now another database that is very popular in uh, in the world of NoSQL database is the Apache Cassandra database. And Apache Cassandra database is the backbone for uh, Facebook and Netflix. Um, you have an option of using uh, Cassandra API. Either you can use the Cassandra API to interact with the uh, Apache Cassandra database, or previously the option was that you were creating a uh, Azure virtual machine and then you were moving, uh, migrating, uh, uh, installing, and migrating Apache Cassandra on it. But now Microsoft has provided you with the uh, Azure Manage instance for Apache Cassandra that you can actually use to uh, migrate your uh, Apache, uh, Apache Cassandra workloads to the to the Azure cloud. And you have to carefully decide which option is, is uh, best for you. As far as the virtual machines is concerned, and if you want to install uh, Apache Cassandra on an Azure virtual machine, you can do it, but uh, you are, uh, but in this case, you actually need a, a technical SME uh, that should be available in your organization who should look for uh, configurations of, uh, uh, of uh, the Apache Cassandra. In Azure Manage instance, you can actually get the benefit of uh, a hybrid connectivity between your on-premise Apache Cassandra database and the Azure Manage instance database or uh, Azure Managed Instance database, uh, Azure Managed Instance for Apache Cassandra in the in the Azure Cloud, but again in this case you need some kind of technical SME in house for for supporting this architecture. On the other hand, if you are a developer, uh, then you can actually use the Cassandra API within Cosmos DB to interact with the Apache Cassandra database that is available on the on-premise location and then you can uh, do the read and write operations using the Apache Cassandra API using Azure Cosmos DB. So these are the uh, these are the options for uh, NoSQL databases in, in Azure. Now I'll talk about the Azure Cache for Redis. Um, there's, Redis is a kind of uh, caching solution that is used in the, in the market and it is one of the very popular caching solutions. And actually, it is a key value store database that runs in the memory. And since it runs in the memory, if you use Redis with a database, it can complement the database operations. Because what will happen is that uh, it will speed up the operations of internal database, or internals like joins and everything. So instead of getting data from the disk, you will be getting data from the Redis cache, and that will uh, speed up your operations. Um, the Azure Cache for Redis is available for version 4.0 and 6.0, and you can also use uh, Azure Cache for Redis as a standalone database. However, in most cases, it is uh, best used to uh, complement uh, Azure SQL database or the Azure SQL managed instance, um, and it can give the exceptionally high reliability of 99.9%. And you can also see what sort of uh, uh, what sort of uh, tiers are available for Azure Cache for Redis. You have a basic tier, you have a standard tier, premium tier, and then you have an enterprise tier and you have enterprise flash tier. This is also something that you need to consider if you are looking for uh, Azure Cache for Redis to be used together with your uh, Azure SQL database or Azure Managed Instance that is doing a lot of memory intensive or disk intensive storage intensive operations. Now guys, uh, um, there is a company that is called uh, GigaOM. They did a kind of benchmarking study to find out what is the benefit that you can achieve by complementing Azure SQL database uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Azure Cache for Redis. And here you can see that uh, as far as the as far as the throughput is concerned, and throughput is a measure of how much traffic the application can handle simultaneously. So as far as throughput is concerned, if you use Azure SQL database, which is uh, two cores, plus you use Azure Cache for Redis, then you get a throughput of 2.44K, which is, which is really, really great. And uh, if you use uh, 
and as far as the latency is concerned, uh, it is the latency is the time duration between uh, when a request is sent by the application and when it is received from for, for uh, received from the database. So if you see uh, Azure SQL database with two cores, the latency is around 381k. And if you use the SQL SQL database for eight cores, then for 99% you get the uh, latency of 8k. Sorry, the latency of 3k. And in the in the case of uh, Azure SQL database with two cores, the latency is 271, which is really great. Guys, you should normally measure latency at an average of above 95% because uh, there is an effect called drive-through effect. And that effect can be reduced if you measure the latency above 95%. So this uh, clearly says that this clearly shows that uh, adding Azure Redis cache with the uh, SQL database can really speed up the performance. And um, this is a link. Uh, this is a link where this uh, study is available. That benchmarking study is available. And I will also share this link in the meeting chat so that you can actually go and uh, read about it. Um, now moving further. Uh, now I'll talk about the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and Microsoft Azure Interconnect. This is a this is a kind of feature in which you can you can use if you are using Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, then and, or you are also using Azure, then you can actually make these two uh, cloud database, uh, these two clouds to talk to each other. And this is a classic example of a multi-cloud architecture, which is getting more and more common in these days. So what is happening is that uh, uh, on the Azure side, you create an express route, and express route is uh, lets you extend your on-premise networks into the Microsoft Cloud using a private connection. So it so th this means that with Azure Express Route, your data is not actually going to the public cloud while it is going through a private connectivity provider. And on the Oracle Cloud infrastructure side, you are using the Fastnet. And Fastnet is also a kind of uh, similar to Express Route in Azure that it also uh, your data also goes through a private connection. It doesn't go on the internet. This means that if you are using this Oracle Cloud and Microsoft Azure Interconnect, you can uh, use Power BI on the Microsoft on the Azure side that is leveraging data from an Oracle database that is running on the Oracle Cloud infrastructure. And uh, the good thing over here is that between Microsoft Azure and between Oracle Cloud infrastructure, the latency is around 1.2 milliseconds to 2.1 milliseconds, which is really, really great. So you have the lowest multi-cloud latency available in this architecture. And with this uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and Microsoft Azure Interconnect, you can get benefit of both uh, the features from Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and the uh, uh, tools and the features in Oracle in and uh, Microsoft Azure. Now the guys, the important thing here to know is that Oracle Cloud Inter Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and Microsoft Azure Interconnect is not available at every place. There are there are very few areas where this uh, uh, this uh, option is available, and these are the seven areas where this feature is available. And uh, I am sitting in the in the region where we are using uh, Azure West Europe as a data center, which is uh, located in uh, in Netherlands and in Azure West Europe you can actually have an option to do a OCI interconnect with the uh, OCI Amsterdam. And this uh, diagram provides you an overview of those locations where there is, there is a possibility to do OCI and Microsoft Azure interconnect. And uh, this is a link that you can actually read for more information about uh, about uh, OCI and Azure Interconnect, and I will also put it in the conversation so that you can read it for in your time. And then, guys, it can also happen that uh, uh, you are not using Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Instead, you have some on-premise Oracle databases running on the virtual machines, and your organization has decided to move to Azure. 
Now, what will happen with these Oracle databases that are running on premise? Then the option is that uh, uh, Oracle provides you with uh, with this option to create an Azure virtual machine, and then you can install or your Oracle databases on those virtual machines, and then you can move your on premise Oracle workloads to this Oracle database in a Azure virtual machine. And uh, this uh, sports Oracle version, Oracle database version 12.1 and higher. And um, uh, the virtual machine images are published by Oracle in the Azure marketplace. And these images are considered bring your own license, which means that you will only be charged for uh, compute storage and networking cost and you can bring your Oracle licenses to the Azure cloud on the machine where you are installing your Azure on your where you're installing your Oracle database. Um, guys, it can it is also possible that if you have your uh, if you have your own images, your custom images on premise custom images, you can also move those custom images to the to the cloud. Um, the important thing to note here is that when you are using Oracle database in Azure, using Azure virtual machine, then you are responsible for implementing the high availability and disaster recovery to avoid any downtime. So if you are using, for example, with uh, with Oracle data guard, you can actually use create two virtual machines and using Oracle data guard, you can create a high availability between the two. And you can also do a disaster recovery uh, by putting Oracle database on a virtual machine in one region and then Oracle database on a virtual machine in another region and then interconnecting those two regions with a with a kind of a VPN gateway. Uh, so this means that uh, if you are using this approach of Oracle database on a Azure virtual machine, there are some DBA activities, Oracle DBA activities uh, that you have to do. Um, Guys, this is the summary of what we have discussed today. This is a picture that is hanging in my room and I always look into it because there are there are a lot of database offerings in Azure and you have to consider each and every one depending upon how your workload should be configured and how you want to arrange your, uh, arrange your uh, data landscape. Okay. So guys, uh, this was all. Uh, if you have any questions, then uh, do let me know and I will try to answer them with the best of my knowledge. And uh, hopefully you would have learned something new from it. Great session, uh, by the way. I really love uh, how you lay it out. Yeah, so if um, there is one question, I think, uh, um, uh, the question yep. was that uh, um, there's open source main free. There's um, open uh, source main free. When you say uh, um, uh, Azure support uh, open source databases like MariaDB, Postgres, uh, and uh, MySQL, um, uh, when you say it's open source, does it mean free? Um, uh, it is not free, but uh, you have to pay for the storage and the compute. Um, so, I mean, you, you have to think it in a way that uh, uh, you are using it on uh, on uh, in a cloud, and in the cloud you are paying for the paying for the storage that you would use. You will be paying for the compute. Uh, that would be there. So it is not free in a way uh, that uh, you consider open source databases to be free because there is some price for it. And also Microsoft is taking care of automatic backups and patching. So there is a price associated with it. And actually Microsoft has a very nice product that is called Azure Pricing Calculator. Uh, let me open this up. You can always go to this uh, tool called Azure Pricing Calculator. And then you can select a specific product like, for example, um, uh, Azure database for MariaDB or Azure database for MySQL, and then you can figure out what sort of uh, pricing is actually associated with it. Because, I mean, there is nothing free in the cloud. The important thing is, as a, as a cloud architect, the important thing is that 
you would like to gain maximum out of the cloud, but you would like to reduce as much as you can on your operational expenses that you pay every month to the cloud vendor. I hope I, I was able to answer the question. Great response. Are there any more questions? Will you share the slide deck? Um, the yes. user? I will okay. share the slide deck and I will also put all the links in the in the chat so that uh, if uh, someone wants to go there and get more knowledge about it, get more information about it, it would be it would be easier. Right. To be honest with you, I got a lot of great feedback user. You did a great job. Thank you. Everybody I mean, uh, it is a very big yeah. topic and it is a big challenge to cover it in approximately one hour, 15 minutes, but I have tried to try to cover it as much as possible. Right. Um, I was about to do um, uh, the raffle. It seems like uh, I'm not able to download the latest for some reason attendees. However, um, uh, is there anybody here that knows Microsoft Teams? Great, in and out. I'm not able to download uh, the latest uh, attendees. Is that possible to, to download the latest attendees while we are live? Let me unmute yourself. Uh, you, give me one second. I'm going to give them access so this way that if, if they want to talk directly to you, they will be able to do that. To unmute sure. themselves. Sure. Yeah. It seems like there's another question. I'm not able to see. Give me one second. Yeah, team is showing me. I have to reconnect. So for some reason, I'm not sure what's going on. I can see there is one question that uh, uh, it is by Gonziela Gervni. Uh, please excuse me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, you're saying that we have a requirement to do cross database joins. What would be the best option for uh, for doing this? Um, if you're doing, I mean, if you're doing cross database joins, uh, then in this case, uh, the best option would be to go for Azure SQL managed instance. Uh, let me put it in, in, in this way that uh, uh, Microsoft is actually branding Azure SQL managed instance a lot, and there are a lot of things that are coming into public preview for Azure SQL managed instance. And uh, it supports a lot of your uh, programming activities and a lot of your applications that are running on premise. The only thing it doesn't support is that it does not provide you opportunity to interact with the operating system because of the nature of the platform as a service play, uh, uh, um, architecture. So if you are using cross database joins, and if you are using cross database joins within a number of databases under the under the Azure SQL under the SQL instance, then I would suggest that the best option would be to go for Azure SQL managed instance. 